The presenting sponsor of Pod Save America is Blue Apron. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. They deliver fresh pre-portioned ingredients and step-by-step recipes right to your door. And they can be cooked in under 45 minutes. The menu changes every week based on what's in season, and it's designed by Blue Apron's in-house culinary team. They have a team of professional chefs putting in a lot of care into creating recipes each week. This month, the featured meals include sheet pan roasted pork with fall vegetables and creamy maple mustard. So good you'll sheet yourself. (laughs) (laughs) Creamy tomato pasta with mushrooms and collard greens. Blue Apron sends only non-GMO ingredients and meat with no added hormones. Blue Apron's treating Pod Save America listeners to their first dinner, a $30 value if you visit blueapron.com slash crooked. So check out... (laughs) Uh, Check out this week's menu and get your $30 off with free shipping at blueapron.com slash crooked. Blue Apron, a better way to... So much shit happened this week, I couldn't... I don't... Cook. (laughs) Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm Dan Pfeiffer. Today on the pod, we will have the interview that Ira Madison and I did at our Santa Barbara show with actor and activist Jesse Williams. Also, thanks everyone who came out this weekend to see us. And, Dan, tickets are on sale now for our 2018 tour date. It's very exciting. They are going fast, people. Get them. They're going fast. The ones that are coming up soon, the Dolby Theater right here in Los Angeles, where they have the Oscars. That's going to be exciting. That's in, yeah. that's in early February. We're going to do one in one in L.A. before we head out on the road again. We're going to be in Europe in January. So there's a couple dates there. And then in February, we got Vegas and Phoenix and Denver. Denver is going really fast, but um, plenty of tickets to Vegas and Phoenix left. So anyway, go check it out. It's crooked.com slash events. You can check out all the tickets. Also, today is December 7th. Open enrollment for... The Affordable Care Act ends on December 15th. So if you or someone you know wants to sign up for health insurance, please go check out healthcare.gov. Very affordable options this year. The good news is the pace for Affordable Care Act enrollment has surpassed other years, despite the Trump administration trying to sabotage it. And yet um, it's going to fall behind where we were in other years because they decided to cut the time for open enrollment in half, um, which is, you know, pretty monstrous and stupid, if you ask me. Yeah. Because today's December 7th, it is also my mother's birthday. So happy oh, birthday, Mom. Happy birthday, Mrs. Pfeiffer. Okay. We are recording this just moments after Democratic Senator Al Franken resigned in a speech on the Senate floor. Uh, he resigned after a seventh woman came forward on Wednesday and accused him of sexual misconduct. This time it was trying to forcibly kiss her in 2006. Uh, The other allegations ranged from forcible kissing to unwanted touching. Franken acknowledged general wrongdoing, but has denied some specifics. On the floor just now, he said, some of the allegations against me are simply not true. Others I remember quite differently. He also said, nothing I have done as a senator, nothing has brought dishonor on this institution, but he acknowledged that he cannot serve for the people of Minnesota effectively as senator while this ethics investigation goes on. Franken's resignation happened after the Politico story broke yesterday about the seventh accuser, and then Senator Kirsten Gillibrand called on him to resign. She was followed by other female Democratic senators, and then eventually the majority of the Senate Democrats, as well as the Democratic National Committee. Dan, what's your reaction to the Franken resignation? Well, I think it's the right thing to do. I am disturbed that Franken clearly believes he did nothing wrong. That was evident in the press conference that he gave a couple weeks ago, uh, where he walked outside of his office and basically said, I'm sorry, but I didn't do any of these things, which was, was like a forced apology. And then he was echoing... What we hear from a lot, so I'd say two things. One, he clearly did not continue to deny the allegations. He does not believe the women. And if it was, and that I think that is troubling. But at the end of the day, what matters is there were there was misconduct. It was from eight different individuals, all with very consistent stories. And 
the set and the Democrats did the right thing and said, we will not tolerate that in our party and asked him to go. And he did the right thing in going for the party and for the people of Minnesota. Yeah. I mean, some have been saying, including some on the right, probably just to cause trouble. Uh, some have said that he, you know, he deserves due process and investigation, didn't get one, you know, and you could argue that this sets a precedent for future incidents, including one where some right wing Trump asshole like a Mike Chernovich falsifies an allegation or, you know, gets an al- allegation falsified, which I, I think is is a legitimate concern. But at the same time, like you just said, you know, if we're saying believe all women and that's a principle right now, which I believe it should be, then when seven women, or I guess you just said eight, come out and have a similar story about sexual misconduct and, you know, that Franken did a similar thing to all of them, which is groped them during pictures, then that's misconduct. And he did acknowledge general wrongdoing. And so, you know, that's... I think I think it was the right thing for him to do as even as hard as this one was. I mean, I think we can acknowledge that the allegations against Franken were less severe than they were against Donald Trump or Roy Moore or John Conyers, another Democrat. It doesn't have to be partisan. And, you know, and even even as they were less severe, you know, if we're going to have zero tolerance for sexual harassment and sexual assault, then zero tolerance means zero tolerance. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I, the one thing that I was I'm somewhat disturbed by is the I, mean, I guess I shouldn't be disturbed. I may have disturbed, but not shocked about some of the media pundit reaction, which frames the Democratic oh. response to this in terms of politics. Now, let's stipulate it's Washington. Politics is overhangs everything, right? The like You can't think about how Democrats respond to Franken without thinking about how the Democrats will handle the potential election of Roy Moore or the mere fact that Donald Trump continues to serve as president despite a long history of sexual misconduct, which we know because he's bragged about it on tape on multiple occasions. But it is also, it can be that this is the politically right thing to do, and it is also just the right thing to do. Well, Yes, Dan. This got me so angry this morning because you're right. Stipulated that there is a political angle to this. And if you are a political journalist, you should cover the political angle. We are going to talk about the politics here. But that's not how a lot of these stories are starting, right? They're sort of jettisoning the actual facts of the case. I saw a headline, an NBC headline this morning, Dems ditch Franken to get more. Um, on CNN today, it was saying Democrats seek moral high ground. Like the problem becomes when it's only about when it's only framed as politics, which is what a lot of political journalists do. And I thought that was pretty uh, it's just so cynical. Right. Like perhaps, you know, I mean, perhaps Al Franken did it because he believed it was the right thing to do to step down. Perhaps Kirsten Gillibrand called on him to step down because she's been someone who's uh, stood up for women and has been fighting, you know, to prevent sexual assault and you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a purely political calculus, even as you acknowledge that politics plays a role in some of this, you know? Right. I think it was Chris Hayes pointed this out on Twitter yesterday that the Democrats, their approach to these issues is different because they have more women women in their caucus than right. the Republicans do. And it was the women senators who led the call for Franken to resign. Kirsten Gillibrand is not new to this issue she has fought her whole life on this her set like one of the major issues she's fought for in her senate career is preventing sexual assault in the military and she has been leading the charge in congress to reform the way congress deals with sexual harassments um with on capitol hill and so it is unfair to her to suggest that she is doing this out of some calculus many of these women senators have talked about their own me too moments in, over the last couple months here. And so it, we should give people the benefit of the doubt that they are sincere in this, particularly in something that is so that is so close to their own experience and on issues they fought for. And it's not easy. Like we see, we've seen this in the media where we've watched the reactions of some of our friends, whether it's Savannah Guthrie or Gail King or Nora O'Donnell, as they've reacted to finding out that their friend and colleague behaved in in horrible ways and trying to reconcile the idea of this person I know and like and and respect 
and work with on a daily basis and this other conduct I'm learning about. Like that is a challenging thing to figure out how to how to handle. And but in the end, they did the right thing. I think they did it for the right reasons. And I think they would have done the same thing even if Roy Moore was down by 15 points in this polls or had lost the primary to Luther Strange. I think it would have ended in the same way. Yeah. And look, again, none of this is easy. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of reaction yesterday and early today. Like there's a lot of Democrats who are upset and don't want, didn't want Franken to resign. There's some who thought, who have thought like it's been too long. He should have resigned earlier. I don't think by any means this was an easy call and an easy issue, uh, especially, especially the Franken case. I think some of the other ones are a little more clear cut that we'll talk about like, like Roy Moore, but you know, it's I, I, like I said, I, I after a lot of thought on this, I come down on that it was the right thing to do. It is outrageous, however, that, you know, still in public life, Republican Representative Blake Farenholt, who settled a sexual harassment suit with his uh, staffer in 2014 for $84,000 paid for by taxpayers. Uh, Alabama Senate candidate Roy Moore, who's been accused of molesting multiple underage women. Plenty of evidence in that case. Uh, and President Donald Trump, who's been accused of sexual harassment and assault by 12 women and was caught bragging about it on tape. You know, Mitch McConnell yesterday, uh, his statement on Franken was quite interesting. He said, while the Senate Ethics Committee is reviewing these serious allegations, it now appears that Senator Franken has lost the support of his colleagues and most importantly, his constituents. I do not believe he can effectively serve the people of Minnesota and the U.S. Senate any longer. And, you know, my question is, can one Republican... Can one Republican explain why Al Franken should step down, but Donald Trump shouldn't? We'd just love to hear one of them try to answer that question. Or Farenthold. Or Roy Moore. Right, exactly. I'd love to hear someone ask the question. As far as I can tell, it's happened once, and it was Steve Inskeep to Paul Ryan, and then Paul Ryan just melted like the Wicked Witch of the West, as it, right as he asked it, and the interview ended. Right. It's just, you know, and I, I, there's a lot of angry Democrats out there who are like, you know, why is he doing this? Why is Franken doing this? Because none of these Republicans are going to uh, step down. And look, I I've said this before on this podcast. The Franken thing is the right thing to do, but we shouldn't pretend this whole idea that, oh, Democrats will then capture the moral high ground and somehow that will help push some of these Republican sexual harassers out of office. I never really believed that was going to be the case because the Republicans don't fucking care. They don't. They just don't care. But that doesn't mean that we should say, OK, well, since you don't care and you're going to let sexual predators run for office and be president of the United States, then we're just going to follow you down that path. Sometimes the right thing is just the right thing. Right. And you have to believe and I believe, despite the dark world of 2017, that in the end, doing the right things is the better politics. I, and if you don't believe that this is what Barack Obama always taught us. Right. We should just give up and become like the Republicans. And that, I mean, I think that would be disastrous for the country, but like we need people to believe in us to turn out and vote. Republicans want people to be so cynical that they think it's not worth voting and their core voters turn out. And so to do that, you got to do the right thing. And if you don't believe that, get out of politics. Yeah, like I, I acknowledge that short term, this probably isn't good politics for us. And, you know, by the way, some people are like, oh, this was easy because a Democratic governor of Minnesota is going to just appoint a Democrat. Well, you know, Minnesota was a little too close for comfort in 2016 uh, when Hillary and Trump went against each other. We now have two seats that we're defending in 2018 in Minnesota, Amy Klobuchar's seat and now um, this seat that uh, that Franken just uh, stepped down from. So uh, it's not it's not a slam dunk by any means. Um, and so I, I don't I don't think that the short term politics of this are or great or a big win. But I do think the right thing to do is right long term for us because, you know, we're a party that A, uh, says that we believe women and that we want to prevent and stop sexual harassment and sexual assault. And I think when politicians show that they have integrity um, and that they're doing what's right, that that might not pay off in the short term, but it does pay off in the long term. And we talked about this a little bit with Anna last week which is what is ultimately critical here is that we have a larger culture change in this country because it is not unique to Hollywood, Congress, media companies that 
sexual harassment and misconduct is, is happening all over the place. It is happening in workplaces of all shapes and sizes all across this country. And we're only finding out about the ones that are very close to the media, which is ferreting these out. And if we're going to have that culture change, it's going to require people to be held accountable. And that includes politicians. Right. And now at this point, basically the only politician, the only people in the country, we've said this before, who have not been held accountable for uh, sexual assault and sexual harassment are Republican male politicians. That's the only group in the country so far. Every other industry, Democrats in politics, uh, everywhere have have stepped down or been forced out of their jobs over these allegations, except for uh, except for Republicans. Speaking of that, you know, we talked about this on the last pod, but the Republican Party has now gone all in on Roy Moore. You've got the RNC. Uh, spending money on the race again. They've jumped back into the race, which is uh, quite an interesting move. Uh, the pro-Trump super PAC is spending a couple million there in the last week. McConnell, who said that he believes Roy Moore's accusers, still think that the people of Alabama should decide, uh, which is as cynical as you can get. Orrin Hatch, um, who, yeah, time for you to retire, buddy, uh, who's out there saying, Oh, yeah, well, these allegations happened years ago, as if there's a statute of limitations on that kind of shit. Unbelievable. And Trump is all in. So what do we think about this? Now, you know, we should acknowledge that Jeff Flake, uh, who's retiring, he sent a check to Doug Jones, tweeted that out. Mitt Romney, who's obviously not in office, he made a pretty strong statement about how the party shouldn't be connected to Roy Moore and that no Senate seat is worth that. You know, why aren't more Republicans donating to Jones. I would quote our fellow podcast host, uh, John Lovett, for this, which mm. is bottomless bad faith. Bottomless bad faith. And, you know, it's like Ben Sass, who has held himself up as the moral conscious of the Republican Party and was very brave in 2016 in standing up to Trump. No doubt. He was very bold about that. But he was on Twitter the other night, basically trying to explain why he opposed more, but it was unwilling to support Jones. And you could sum up his position as mm -hmm. word salad, right? Politics is a binary choice. You have two options. You can either have Roy Moore, who is a child muster, or Doug Jones, who is by all accounts, a good moral public servant. Those are your two choices. There is not a third option of blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Those are the two choices. And Making a choice requires courage, and they are unwilling to have it because of politics. It's all it is. They are afraid that Steve Bannon is going to come to their state. They are afraid that Donald Trump is going to tweet about them. They're afraid the, you know, the Roy Moore base, whatever the fuck that is, the pro pedophilia wing of the party will come after them. It's not you would the easiest thing in politics should be opposing a child molester, but they can't yeah. do it. And the, the overhang of this also is important is. They are very afraid they're going to need Roy Moore's vote to pass this tax bill because they can only lose two votes and they are in danger of not being able to fulfill the deal that they gave Susan Collins, which she agreed to vote for the tax bill last week. And so what it really comes down to is that a tax cut for the rich supporting child molester is preferable to a Democrat. That's Which right. is a joke that if we had made about Republicans, we would have been lambasted for being unfair to them. We can't, it is impossible to be unfair to this Republican Party because every time you set the level of what would be below the belt, they go below it. Yeah, and we should uh, we should just talk about this as an aside with this tax bill here. So it goes to conference committee so that they can resolve the differences between the House and the Senate bill. But like you said, normally what happens is it goes to conference committee, they work out a new bill that's a combination of the House and the Senate bill, resolve the differences, and then the bill has to go back to pass the House one more time and to pass the Senate one more time. Now, some people have said, well, if they get in trouble here, basically the House can just pass the Senate bill without a conference committee, even though the House wants some changes. And in an emergency, the House can just do this and the differences aren't that big and it's fine and Republicans can get their tax cut. Well, <laughs> maybe not anymore because... They are now realizing that as they were scribbling changes onto the bill at one in the morning when they were trying to pass this tax cut, they made a bit of a mistake. 
It was a three hundred billion dollar mistake. <laughs> they basically, their whole purpose of the of the tax bill was to,、um, you know, give corporations. Allow corporations to take advantage of of certain deductions and and lower taxes and what have you. We won't bore you with all the details, but basically because we don't understand them, that's why. You know, I tried last night. There's something about like it's very hard right now. The way it is drafted now,、uh, corporations can no longer use the research and development tax credit, which quite a few companies use. And then you know the whole way internationally businesses are taxed, they wanted to change that. That was the whole purpose of the bill, and that's now null and void because of a mistake that they made. So. Basically, Basically, companies would have to pay 300 billion more in taxes than they originally wanted them to、uh, because of this mistake. And if there's anything, if there's any mistake that's going to cause them to go back to the drawing board, it's making companies pay 300 billion more dollars than they thought. So Just- now they really do need a conference committee, and now the Senate really does have to vote on the bill again. And like you said, they already have one no vote with Corker. They need Collins, and just this morning. The assholes in the Freedom Caucus in the House said, "Oh, all the things that Collins was promised by McConnell to fix health care to get her vote, we're not doing them. They're non-starters. So, nothing that Collins actually wanted, and the the whole reason that she voted for this thing is because she made she got these IOUs from Mitch McConnell. None of that stuff now is going to end up in this bill, at least if a lot of these House Republicans have anything to say about it. We'll see. Maybe they'll change their mind. So then, if you don't have Corker, and then if Collins actually stands by her principles,、uh, which is a big open question, and votes no, then if Doug Jones comes to the Senate, then that means that's three no votes, and then the bill fails. So they really need Roy Moore in the Senate. So Steve Bannon was down in Alabama, stumping for、uh, stumping for his friend Roy Moore, and he, of course, most of his attacks were focused on Jeff Flake.、Uh, he attacked Mitt Romney for his statement and decided to attack Mitt Romney for not serving in Vietnam because he was hiding behind his religion. He attacked Mitt Romney's sons for not serving. This is the Steve Bannon who was campaign manager for draft dodger Donald Trump. Who decided that he couldn't enlist in Vietnam because of bone spurs, imaginary bone spurs? What a monster! <laughs> just I me. Mean, it's just really the worst person. He really like. I know we always say Donald Trump is our worst citizen, and he probably is. But <laughs> but Steve Bannon is coming up fast. Like he is just. I mean, the thing that it is so galling. How important and smart he thinks he is, and how willing the Republicans are to allow him to continue believing that by inviting him down there and then acting like like he matters that much. And he, is this worth pointing out? He runs a website out of his basement. <laughs> anyway, the point is. Support Doug Jones. This race is not over by any means. You know, I think Doug Jones is an underdog here, but he's got a real shot. Harry Enten on Five Thirty Eight has a piece out today talking about how unreliable—not unreliable, but how a lot of Senate polls, the margin of error has been quite large over the last ten, fifteen years. And Moore's probably three-point lead right now is well within the margin of error. And look, like this should not be. It's interesting. We focus a lot on、uh, Roy Moore's on the allegations against him by these women for molesting underage women. But even before that Washington Post story broke, this is a man who said homosexuality should be illegal, a man who said that women shouldn't be able to vote, or run for office, and that Muslims shouldn't serve in Congress. Way before that Washington Post story, this man. Should have been disqualified from office. It is insane that the party, that the Republican Party, is behind this guy. Insane. They have decided that they are willing to support essentially R. Kelly for Senate. Yeah. I mean, it's really unbelievable. And you know, you sort of reference this in the McConnell tweet, but it's been really interesting to watch the how the Republicans are setting themselves up to justify not kicking more out of the Senate because it's worth remembering. The Senate McConnell has the power to send Roy Moore home, right? He can expel him from the Senate if he is elected, which they almost certainly would have done if he was elected. And then these allegations came out, and he refused to resign. Right. But so last night on Fox News, you had a bunch of horrible people defending Al Franken, basically saying he was being run out of town without due process. And then Newt Gingrich, moral conscious of the Republican Party, tweeted, "Franken, one million." Minnesotans picked him for Senate in 2014. 30 self-appointed quote pure senators won him out. What happened to popular vote? 
So this is all the justification for, well, he's terrible, but who are we to say, to tell the people of Alabama, we will not accept their, we will not invite their child molester to our weekly lunch so we can vote for our bills. It's gross. Doug Jones, people. I thought Doug Jones had a, uh, a great line the other day. I'm proud of what I've done to ensure that men who hurt little girls end up in jail and not the Senate. Doug Jones, we talk a lot about Roy Moore on this, on this pod, but Doug Jones is as good of a candidate and as good of a Democrat and as good of a human being as you can find. This is a man who prosecuted KKK members who murdered little girls and so uh, and has had a long career on being tough on crime and he's a good Democrat and, um, you know, we should send him to the United States Senate. The people of Alabama should. So donate to Doug Jones and, uh, and hopefully he can pull it through. Okay, when we come back, we're going to have Tommy Vitor on to talk about the Trump administration's decision to declare Jerusalem the capital of Israel. Pods of America is brought to you by Omaha Steaks. Are you struggling to find the perfect gift for someone who has it all of it? Always. You get the perfect gift and avoid the mall's lines and crowds. I hate the crowds at the mall. Me too. Me too. It's like, what, we're, you know, we're trying to get a table at the Cheesecake Factory here. <laughs> You know, let me tell you about Omaha steak. 70 Omaha. minutes. Let me tell you about how what kind of animals are waiting for a table that long to have some respect for yourselves. We did. We tried, but we didn't take the buzzer. No, it was an hour wait in San Francisco to go to Cheesecake Factory because of those lines and crowds at the mall. <laughs> Love it. Aaron Ryan and I tried our best. That was pun at barking. That was Leo. <laughs> let me tell you about how Omaha steaks and how for only forty nine ninety nine you can get their family gift pack when you go to omahasteaks.com and enter PSA in the search bar. That's 75% off of it. I give this to my father all the time. He loves the Omaha steaks. We go up to Thousand Oaks, cook up some Omaha steaks. It's I got to mail some steaks to Florida. Do it. Right now, Omaha Steaks is giving an exclusive savings just to our listeners. Listen to everything that you will get for less than $50. Two filet mignons, two top sirloins, two boneless pork chops, four boneless chicken breasts, four kielbasa sausages, four burgers, four potatoes au gratin, four caramel apple tartlets, one Omaha steak seasoning packet, plus four additional kielbasa sausages for free. Go to omahasteaks.com, enter code PSA in the search bar and get a 75% savings. It's the gift guaranteed to be a hit. That's a good deal. This is a great gift. Ponte America is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. If you're hiring, you know the quality hires keep your business moving forward, but you also know it can take a lot of time to find the right candidate for the job. Do we ever? Yes. <laughs> with ZipRecruiter, you can post your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards with just <laughs> one click, so you can rest easy knowing your job is being seen by the right candidates. Then ZipRecruiter puts its smart matching technology to work, actively notifying qualified candidates about your job within minutes of posting so you receive the best possible matches. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other hiring sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on the right candidates finding you, it finds them. You can even get a head start on the interview process by adding screening questions to your job post to help identify the most qualified candidates. Are you a disgraced former national security advisor? Are you under house arrest because of the crimes you committed in Ukraine? <laughs> <laughs> no wonder 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. And the easy-to-use dashboard lets you manage your hiring process from start to finish all in one place. ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. Smartest. <laughs> find out today why it's been used by growing businesses of all sizes and industries to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. Right now, Pod Save America listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. One more time. ZipRecruiter.com slash crooked. There you go. Okay, we're back with Tommy Vitor. Vitor Detour here. Hey, guys. Hey, Tom. Um, Hi, Tommy. Hi, Thursday. So I didn't really have time to read all about this yesterday because there were 80,000 other things in the news. Yeah. But I heard that the uh, Trump administration declared that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. It is. And that the U.S. Embassy would be moving there. Or at least that was the plan. And that this decision was pushed on him by our friend Jared Kushner. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's the background here? Why did he do this? What's what's the backstory? So in doing this, he broke with like seven decades of U.S. policy. Um, he also broke with essentially everyone else in the world. All the Arab states didn't want him to do this. Uh, allies like France, like the Pope, uh, frenemies like China, uh, reportedly even members of his national security team didn't want him to do this. And the reason is, well, there's a few reasons. One, Jerusalem is a final status issue, meaning it's going to have to be negotiated between the Israelis and the Palestinians to figure out sort of which land goes to which group of people and where the capital is. It's always been assumed that 
the Israeli capital will be in Jerusalem, but that the Palestinian capital will be in East Jerusalem, which will mean the city has to be divided in some way that is somewhat equitable and fair. I think Palestinians and Arab states rightly feel like Trump just gave the Israelis sort of the most important piece of these negotiations because of the religious and historic significance of that piece of territory. So, yeah, I just want to talk about that. The religious significance of Jerusalem is that for both the Muslim world and the Jewish world, it's Jerusalem is an important city. Is that? Yeah, I mean, for, for Muslims, Christians, and Jews, right? right? You have the Temple Mount, you have the Alaska Mosque, you have like enormous historic religious significance in this one city. And so, uh, you know, obviously it is, it is a fraught, fraught decision and, um, you know, something that has been deeply litigated for like literally decades, trying to figure out neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block, which territory will go to which group. And Trump just came out and said, you know, here's your capital. Now, th- his his team will say, essentially, he was just stating a, a fact, a reality that ultimately Jerusalem will be the capital of Israel. That is in some ways true, but it's still a big deal that the United States, which is you know, supposed to be an honest broker in these negotiations would be seen to be giving such a huge chit to the Israelis this early in the process. Because this has been a sticking point for every single Middle East peace nego- set of negotiations for as far back as there have been negotiations on Middle East peace. Yeah, right? I mean, there are huge, every part of the Middle East peace process is a, a, a brutal long-term uh, negotiation. And that goes for sort of borders, specific territory. I mean, when you're talking about like settlement construction and how those might be swapped, how sort of territory where Israelis have built settlements in the West Bank might be swapped for territory that Israelis currently hold. You're literally talking about like block by block, right? So this is painstaking stuff. But the Jerusalem portion of these negotiations is the most delicate and most sensitive and most important because of all that historical significance. In the reporting, uh, Jared Kushner, who is whose uh, main job it appears to be is to try to strike a Middle East peace deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians, is uh, reported to have pushed very hard for this, according to friends close to Jared, which is mm-hmm. usually Jared. Um, <laughs> yeah. Why would he do this? If why? I guess that's the only question because I can't figure it out. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to tell. I mean, I think Trump, like, I think the reports I've read is that, and this makes sense to me, is that Trump wanted to do this because he thinks I made a promise and I'm going to deliver on my promise and other presidents haven't. And it's a talking point that's political and he can seem pro-Israel. So he's coming out in favor of this. I think, I think Jared Kushner, and, you know, I, I could kind of get where his head is on this, looks at this problem and thinks every administration has essentially tried doing this the same way for 70 years. Let's try something different. I get that, but I do think that he's probably listening to his friends in Saudi Arabia. He's listening to the Israelis who have convinced him to try something new that I think will be viewed by almost the entire world as putting a thumb on the scale in a big way for the Israelis and ultimately probably making getting to a peace agreement harder. Like there is no peace process right now. There is no that we know of publicly. There's no set of talks that are ongoing. There's no negotiations. There's no process. There's no nothing. Obama tried and we failed, you know, not for lack of trying, but it's where we are. What are the consequences of this move or what might be some of the consequences? So the near-term consequences are strong reaction in the Arab world in particular. Uh, You've got Hamas calling for a, a new intifada. You're, you know, seeing calls for a day of rage. You may see, you've seen protests on the streets, sort of as we're talking in Gaza uh, and in the West Bank, clashes between security forces and uh, Israeli security forces and people. So that could get worse. They could flare up and then go away. You know, there is a broader political consequence that it might sort of permanently kill any effort in negotiation, it might lead uh, Arab states to withdraw their backing for any sort of U.S.-led peace process. So we don't really know yet. This, like, all these countries talk about the Palestinian issue and, and ex- you know, pay a lot of lip service because it lets them attack the Israelis. Uh, it's not clear to me how much sometimes the people who, who loudly decry uh, the occupation actually care about, like, the plight of the Palestinian people. So I don't know you know, how far this will lead. But, you know, the State Department set up a 24-hour monitoring center to see if there's violence. So it's not good in the near term. So potential near-term violence and unrest, 
long-term potential collapse of the middle of the, of the peace process right. and uh but uh, hey at least the trump administration got a talking well, point but the, and then that's the frustrating thing it's like what what did we get for this right. we gave the israelis this huge negotiating chip and it's not clear we got anything back like the the best argument i've heard is that maybe down the road because we gave them this piece now we might be able to try to extract something hard there's no evidence I, that netanyahu is willing to make a tough decision he certainly wasn't with obama Tommy, I think you might be giving the Trump administration too much credit yeah. because they are going to get something. They're going to get Sheldon Adelson's millions of dollars in campaign donations, yeah. which he's the one who pushed for this. And so like, you can tie this in some ways to what they did with the tax cut bill. We are there, in a, there is a systematic approach to give a foot rub to every billionaire Republican donor who's been concerned about what's been happening in the administration to date. So the Kochs got their tax break, the hedge fund guys got their carried interest break, and Sheldon Adelson gets this policy priority of his. Yeah. You know, it's like the the Washington Post had a piece that posted last night and today, and, and it was consistent in uh, sort of after action TikTok stories about Trump making big foreign policy decisions where a whole bunch of people read out that it seemed like he doesn't really understand the underlying issue or the consequences or wow, what's going surprising. on. And, and he's just <laughs> making a political call. And, you know, here we are com- politicizing the most delicate issue in all of U.S. foreign policy you know, on a platter by Donald Trump. But you know what? Uh, Jared's had a tough time over the last couple of months, and he really needed a win. Needed I read that win. in a few stories. Really Jared a win. needed a win, guys. Yeah. He's maybe back on and back in the good graces in the White House. Jared's back. <laughs> Jared's back in the good graces. Well, thank you, Tommy. Sure. That was uh, that was very helpful. Uplifting. I, I, we were hoping for some Russia news. There's no. There's really not a lot of Russia updates except for except for the Don Jr. met for. Eight hours with the House Intelligence Committee yesterday and then uh, decided to cite attorney-client privilege <laughs> when asked about a conversation he had with his father about Junior's meeting with several Russian spies who offered dirt on Hillary Clinton during the campaign. And apparently Junior said there was an attorney in the room during the conversation, yeah. so he doesn't have to say anything. Yeah, Eric Trump invoked an executive privilege because he works at a big company. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, this, this is, I mean, this is so funny, guys. This is a joke I used to make all the time in the White House with Kathy Rundler, which was White House counsel, is I would threaten to put CC her on all my emails so they would always be attorney-client privilege. She did not think that was a good idea and did not think it was funny that I made the joke. Um but I guess Donald Trump Jr. took it completely seriously and went for it. We also can't forget that Mike Flynn, coming right out of the oh, yeah. uh, inauguration, decided to text a business partner and tell him they were going to rip up the sanctions right away. And build a bunch of uh, nuclear facilities all over the Middle East. It's like, <laughs> uh, if you guys had read that story aloud to me a year ago, I never would have believed it. I would have said it was ridiculous. He is the most corrupt motherfucker ever. Maybe in this whole administration. Ever. He's so bad at it. So yeah, no, he may not be the most corrupt, but he's only the most incompetent at being corrupt. Yeah, yeah. the you incompetent should. and corrupt scale. He's definitely usually yeah. Intel guys like understand tradecraft and not leaving an electronic trail of your crimes. <laughs> not Mike Flynn. No. Text away. He was the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Yeah. Okay. Well, stay tuned on that. Pods of America is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace. Are you looking to make your next move? Yes. Well, you can do so with a beautiful website from Squarespace. You can get your unique domain and create a beautiful website. Squarespace has beautiful award-winning designer templates. There's nothing to install, patch, or upgrade ever. Squarespace provides award-winning 24-7 customer support and a unique domain experience that's fully transparent and simple to set up. It's used by a wide range of creatives, people, and businesses. Creatives. Musicians, designers, artists, Restaurants. You know, the word podcast. creative and the word hipster are similar in that no one ever uses it to describe themselves. I'm a creative. No one ever says, I'm a hipster. Not ironic. People might say it ironically. Yeah, I mean, cre- it's different in that creatives really do describe a class of people, but hipster is a stereotype, you know? Use offer code CROOKED for 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. I'm not a hipster. I have an internal experience, you know? <laughs> I'm not your category. Pots of America is brought to you by the Cash App. The Cash App. You know the drill, guys. If it's not on your phone, put it on your phone. If it's not on your friend's phone, put it on your friend's phone. You put in the code PODSAVE. Do us a favor. Walk around your office today. Walk around your home, wherever you are. And just start picking up people's phones and looking to see if they have the cash out. If, you're an, not, identical right tw- if you're an identical twin, take your other twin's iPhone 10, use your face to unlock their phone, <laughs> and then download the cash app onto their phone. Okay. All you identical twins out there, give it a whirl. 
Anyway, if you download the Cash App, you get five dollars. Five dollars goes to World. You got to use Kitchen. the code Pod Save. You got to use the code Pod Save. Five dollars goes to World Central Kitchen. Jose Andres is helping a lot of people in Puerto Rico cooking meals for them. We've already donated thousands of dollars thanks to you. It's now over donors choose and on the and the refugee donations. It's tens of thousands. Yeah. So download the Cash App today, and it's the easiest way to pay people back. You know, we're, we're not, not using, using the other, the other apps, apps anymore. Anymore. We're Cash App. Cash App. <laughs> You've seen him in The Butler, Brooklyn's Finest, and Grey's Anatomy. He is executive producer of the documentary Stay Woke, the Black Lives Matter movement, and the upcoming documentary Withdrawn Arms. He's also taking Silicon Valley by storm with the launch of his new app, Blebrity. Actor and activist, Jesse Williams. What's up, everybody? Hello, hello. Thanks for joining us. Of course. Of How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm oh. doing great. Any excuse to come to Santa Barbara. <laughs> um, many people obviously know you as an actor, but um, you've made quite an impact off screen. You've spoken out against police brutality, in favor of Americans' right to protest, against white supremacy. You didn't have to speak up about these issues, but, but you have. What's been the inspiration behind speaking out for you? Uh, I think, I mean, I've always had it. This is who I've always been. This is who I was raised to be. I just happened to have started acting, which means there are more cameras around. Um, I I think ultimately I just didn't change. Um, honestly, that I don't mean that as like a line, but I it didn't. I didn't receive some new inspiration. I just kept absorbing as much information as possible, trying to understand historical context of people's liberation movements around the world and in this country, and uh, try to articulate them when I see. Um, gaps in the communication line and get frustrated with what I don't see somehow, even though we have 24 hours of news all day, every day, and, and thought anytime I feel like I can uh, throw some context in there, I, I take a swing at it. Is there a moment for you where you decided enough's enough, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start talking about these issues? You, well, yeah, there's, there's been several. I think particularly uh, I felt really inspired, proud, happy, uh, amidst some misery, but around what ha- around the slaughter of Trayvon and then into Ferguson, and and I, and I say what made me happy, what kind of fulfilled me in some way was how inspired I was by watching people organize in those communities and more importantly sustain them over days into weeks into months and watch Ferguson really become something that I think people expected to fizzle eventually. Eventually they'll stop and it'll, a couple of weeks into it they'll stop and they didn't and um, that was something that really um, made me really excited about an opportunity and inspired by watching my peers um, stay vigilant and, and, some, and try to marry that fire with impacting policy on a local, regional and, and federal level. Speaking of... Um some of your peers, um, what's that sort of like, you know, when you are an outspoken sort of actor and celebrity, you know, navigating the spaces where, you know, you may be working with people who aren't, aren't as outspoken, you know, do they ever have, are there moments where you find like teachable moments where you can, you know, tell other people, you know, if you would like to speak out, this is how you can speak out, or do you ever find some people are like, I just don't want any part of that? Uh, all of the above, certainly. Uh-huh. Uh, when you say peers, you mean ac- fellow Act- actors, actors, right? Yeah. Yeah, we have, you know, I find ye- I- I'm constantly meeting folks who want to figure out. Some people don't really mean it. Hey, and if there's anything I can do, let me know. And, and, but most people do. And, and I try to meet them at whatever level they want to be on, they choose to be on, or they are on. And um, that's, excuse me, that could be just one-on-one conversation, dialogue, pointing folks in the right direction um, for some reading or a way to kind of get their, their weight up, as it were, or pointing them in the direction of organizations that I'm a part of. I'm, a, I'm on the um, board of directors at the Advancement, Pro- at Advancement Project, which is a tremendous national org- advocacy organization, um, as well as like Sankofa, Harry Belafonte's organization, which is really built around connecting artists with activism and following in his footsteps. So trying to figuring out where exactly they want to find an entry point into the conversation, a, a word I actually hate nowadays, but into the actual work <laughs> yeah. uh, of it all. And, um, uh, you know, but I also am not somebody who believes that 
everybody needs to be doing what I'm doing, certainly, or that everybody has some innate responsibility that just because they're famous, they have to be out there fighting the good fight. I think that, you know, some people just want to sing. And some people, just because you can, I've said this many times, just because you can dunk a basketball, I don't think that means you have some uh, way more responsibility as a human being, as a member of um, the populace th than a teacher or a plumber or anybody else. Like, we've all got to step forward and, and be awake and, and, and participate, I think. And famous people can do more damage than good if they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Absolutely. You we've know. seen uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> have you seen some of that um, backlash towards you? You know, if we talk about, you know, the... You, we see, like, the Colin... Um, Kaepernick's of the world. You know, we mm -hmm. see the kind of backlash they get. It comes from the White House, you know. Um, but, you know, what sort of do you find yourself um, brushing up against? Oh, well, um, red-faced, furious people who send me handwritten death threats and threaten me and my family and mm -hmm. tr try to get me to lose my job and my livelihood and my life sometimes. And, you know, and, and uh, that's, that's just part of it. That's the way it is, and it certainly affects my business, certainly affects my bottom line and not getting work because people don't like my politics, but um, that's okay. That's part of the deal. That's what I signed up for. Um, but, but I think we also need to be careful that, like, there's no, there's kind of, people often ask, you know, about what's Hollywood, how's Hollywood reacting, how's white Hollywood reacting, and uh, there's not really such a thing as Hollywood in my experience. There are really horrible trash people in that business making crap. There are brilliant, inspired, thinking, wonderful people making really incredible stuff, putting themselves at risk, pushing the limits, and finding new ways to use alternate, alternative forms of media. It just, there is a lot of diversity within the business, is my point, and um, I don't view it as this monolithic kind of cloud hanging over me. Some people don't you know, we, we all make choices, and um, I, didn't, I didn't, my life's work is not to be an actor. This business wasn't my dream. It's what I happen to be doing now. I'm, I'm fine without it. It's, what, you know, it's not something that um, I'm clinging to in a way that is going to affect my choices to leave a legacy and kind of participate. What was that dream? Being a civil rights attorney was the only dream I had. Also football. I was going to be a football player. Uh -huh. I didn't fill out uh -huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, as hard as I tried. So I scrapped that and I was certain I was going to be a civil rights attorney. Uh, I still might. I still, I still very well might be. Um, that's what f fulfills me. This work makes me happy. Yeah. Chadwick Boseman would play you in a biopic. <laughs> He'd play all of us. <laughs> in. He's playing John next. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I think you know, the purpose of protests often is to make people feel uncomfortable about controversial issues. How do you balance that need with the desire to persuade people and to convince them to see things in a different light? Well, I think I disagree a little bit. I, I don't view protest as a, a, any part of its goal. I don't view ma discomfort as a goal. I view it as for some... It's really about the recipient more than it is, so, in some ways, than the person who's, who's trying to draw attention to, to a topic. Discomfort might be part of it. Uh, but I, I do take... I think your, your question really is, how do you find ways to frame things and articulate an issue without creating more distance yeah. than, um, than is necessary, polarizing folks, making them feel uncomfortable. Some of that, you know, it really depends on the audience and, and the topic. You know, I choose to try to be as uh, close to truth as I understand it as possible and cut with as sharp a knife as, as I possibly can, be, excuse me, precise and, and efficient with language um, and, and know the audience. And if, and if the discomfort is a part of that, well, fucking, we've been uncomfortable for centuries. So we'll figure, yeah, you guys can handle it. I think that juggling, there is a very specific discomfort that really is the one that matters, because this is a white country, and there's this thing called white fragility, and yeah. you guys, we got to talk to you very carefully sometimes. <laughs> and, and that's all good. And sometimes... That's, that is a push and pull and a, and a dance. And I think that um, if you're coming from, like anything in a relationship that's personal or, or huge, if you're coming from a place of love, coming from a place of trying to draw things together, you know, in an argument, if your goal is to meet in the middle, if your goal is to come together, that's so very different than if your goal is to tell, get somebody yeah, to win or <laughs> right. to keep going or to get somebody to fuck off. It's, it's different. 
And, um, you know, I like to participate in conversations, dialogue, megalogue, that is around a solution. It's really solution-oriented, and um, sometimes you need to, in order to um, trigger empathy and understanding, you need to really try to create space for them to feel and touch and smell what it is that you're living through. And uh, the thing is, none of us are experts on everything. We're pretty ignorant on most things, right? Depends on what topic that you want to focus on. And giving people a chance to um, forgive themselves sometimes for not knowing what they didn't know until they were taught. Um, but also, there's gotta, that's got to meet curiosity. Mm -hmm. Where, as you get older, like, you got to demonstrate a real curiosity about things. You got to ask and, and, um, and lean, lean forward into some of these things uh, so that you're a worthy student. You kind of got to earn being a student as much as, as, much as um, just sitting there isn't enough. So in addition to acting and producing, you've also become a tech entrepreneur. You've built several apps. Yeah. What made you decide to follow that path? Uh, a variety of reasons. Uh, the, my first foray, well, I guess my first entry into, kind of into apps was with Question Bridge, Black Males, this really dope, excuse me, I haven't had a beer in a while. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be cool with the fellas, you know? Um, and, uh, drink here, but yeah. but uh, was this... this, this transmedia project we did around black male identity that opened at, at Sundance in 2012. We went around the country interviewing black men from all walks of life, putting a camera on them, kind of Brady Bunch style, just them in a frame, and asking them to look into the camera and ask a question of other black men that they feel detached from, whether they, that's eco socioeconomically, politically, generationally, geographically, religious, whatever. It's a question you've always wanted to ask other black men. So we collected all of these questions for men, and then turned, it, turned the questions on them and had them answer some questions. And what we ended up with was 150 hours of black men having these really private, intimate conversations with other men they've never met before. And we put it up on these 10-foot pillars, five 10-foot pillars in museums. It's now at the Smithsonian uh, in D.C., the, the African-American Smithsonian and Brooklyn Museum. Oh. And it demonstrates this, um, the diversity within our demographic. There's more diversity within the demographic than there's outside of it. Black folks are not this homogenous group. There's no such thing as black guys do this. It's not, you can't complete that sentence. So that turned into an app where people can play around with it. So that, that was my first entry into kind of figuring out how technology and mobile devices can be used, since we're all going to have our heads, heads down and plugged into them anyway, how can they be used to kind of open things instead of close conversations? And then it uh, turned in, then I uh, joined a team at Scali, which is, a, is a, a, a really dope scholarship app. We simply connect students to the hundred million dollars of unclaimed scholarships that exist every year. Wow. We've connected students to almost a hundred million dollars, over eighty million dollars in scholarships uh, for graduate school and undergraduate school. And then it's also fun. I think I realized, John, looking at social media, looking at how much blackness really drove trends, fashion, dialogue, conversation, the way people behave, move, and, and create in artistic spaces, and drove political conversations, black Twitter driving like seven of the top ten trending topics per week. But we don't own any of it. We're not hired by any of those companies. We're not participating in the dialogue. We're just kind of swagging out other people's products. Um, so I, we started Abroji, which was a way to use kind of gifts and nuance and to add tone and texture to your conversations online, your mobile conversations, and try to be subversive in encouraging people to use black and brown and trans and LGBTQ bodies to express love and LOL and happiness and discomfort or whatever these reactions are. Um, there's just, there wasn't to normalize Blackness. We don't always have to be demonstrating or giving you a biopic of some hero or being slaves or, or tri you know, experiencing some huge triumph. We can just be people. And uh, so, we, so, so that was what that was about. And that's really fun. And, and then we have Belebrity, which is just a great, fun game. It's, just a, it's a really fun kind of, I say parlor game, but I feel like I'm in the 30s when I say that. <laughs> I feel like, what's a parlor? But it's like charades, um, but it just centers and normalizes black culture instead of all these other games that was always, you know, watching. Uh, we were playing Belebrity, which is, you know, it's, you've got topics like music or movies or things that black moms say. And, uh, and uh, we also have a category for white folks invited to the cookout. You might want to take a look, see if you're on the list. <laughs> um, but, uh, but we were playing this with a bunch of friends, and we had two uh, white friends that were, that are good friends of ours that were playing. They sat at a different table, obviously. And, um, <laughs> I'm kidding. 
but we were playing and we were all having a great time. And we, I noticed like they weren't answering anything. They didn't know the answers to this particular very black topic. Right. And I was like, wow, that's how we feel. We felt what, playing games our whole lives that don't have anything to do with us, don't include, they call it, you call it pop culture, but it's really white pop culture. Yeah. Or like, it, you know, it's like R&B, but only when white people do it. Like that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so this was just something, it's not, this is just a fun game that we realized that we wanted to just kind of, what if we centered ourselves in the game? What if when we said pop culture, we included us? What if when we say music, we included us? What if when we list TV shows, it's not just Friends, Seinfeld, and Frasier? It's things that we also watch, too. Those are all some of my favorite shows. <laughs> but, but, you know, it just yeah. includes us without it having to be um, a really big deal. That's great. And, it's, and it's doing really great because um, people like to have fun. That's cool. Yeah. Um, well, before we let you go... You want to give it a go, don't we you? Wanna, we want to play a little game here as well. We have John Lovett, who's... Uh, Gonna there host he is. It. Guys, all right. Now for a game called Bleberty. Here's how it works. He explained it. Uh, we're gonna do our version of it, which is a political version of Bleberty. Don't worry, I see what you all people look like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Every answer is Omarosa. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. It's Om Omarosa or Blackish. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're gonna play a political version of Bleberty right now. We're going we're gonna to put a minute on the clock, and we're going to go through. We're going to put something up on the screen, and one by one we're going to play. I'm going to go first, and we're just going to rotate through. As we get them, we'll hear a bell. Are you guys ready? So we're I'm ready. I'm going to give you clues. You're giving me yeah. clues. I'm not going to see the screen. Okay. 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 And then when, if I get it, then we're going to give Jesse clues, then Ira, etc. So we want to get you to say Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren. Warren. What is Trump Pope called? Elizabeth? There you go. <laughs> How dare you, by the way. <laughs> Department of Education, Secretary of Education. Uh, Arnie Duncan. Uh, no, 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 no. The, the now? He's, a, he's a surgeon. He's a surgeon, but he seems they like he's mentally Carson. ill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a better doc. <laughs> ESPN. Fire from ESPN. Jamel Hill. Yep. Love Jamel. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> the, appre the Apprentice. She's the answer to everything. <laughs> yes! Oh, uh, many people are talking about him more lately. Uh, um, He's getting a lot oh, of recognition uh, lately. Leader of Abel yeah. <laughs> people say my dad oh, looks uh, like him. Uh, he referred to, uh, uh, Donald Mexican Trump referred to people. Mexican people. Uh, they're not good people there. Rapists. Yeah. <laughs> uh, That's true. If you were, if you were, in his mind, they Opposite all wear sombreros. Good? Oh, bad hombres, yep. come on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, she was White disinvited House reporter. from the White House Christmas party. Um, uh, January, February, March. April. Oh, Ryan. That's, That's it. the way you give clues if you don't know. Sarah okay. Huckabee's nemesis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Sarah Huckabee's nemesis. She just wants to know who made that pie. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> so badly. Everybody's fun. That was good. See? That was great. That was a good that. It's that easy. Jesse Williams, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks yeah. for having really me, guys. Thank you so much. It.